This picture of two well-dressed ladies on a journey was painted in 1862. The balance and symmetry of the composition, the rich fabrics and fine details of the clothing, the strongly modelled faces of the two travellers, the glowing colours, the haunting atmosphere of the scene, have made this work of art into an enduringly popular image of the Victorian age. As well as having great visual appeal, this painting is endlessly fascinating and engaging. Since it emerged from a private collection in the 1950s, it has been frequently exhibited and has been extensively written about and reproduced. It is one of the best known of Victorian paintings and one of the best loved works in the collection of Birmingham Art Gallery, where it has been since 1957. Its title is The Travelling Companions and it was painted by British artist Augustus Leopold Egg. The Travelling Companions, today perhaps one of the best known of Victorian paintings, is certainly the best known painting by Augustus Leopold Egg. Egg was born in London on 2nd May 1816. As a student at the Royal Academy in the late 1830s, he was a member of a group known as the Clique, which emphasised genre painting and subjects drawn from literature and history, rather than the grandiose subjects of academic high art and by and large he remained true to those artistic preferences throughout his career. He became best known for his moralising social realist and narrative works, such as Past and Present, a sequence of three paintings dealing with adultery, and for his genre works and paintings of scenes from history, from historical novels and from plays. Egg's great inspiration was William Hogarth, and in his social critiques, his sometimes ironic humour, and his concern with the careful depiction of detail, he followed in the Hogarthian 18th century tradition. But he was also influenced by contemporary trends in painting, particularly pre-Raphaelitism. His paintings can seem static and laboured, rather theatrical and stagey. Egg was an amateur actor of some note, but they are also highly finished, reward close attention and are often beautiful to look at. The Travelling Companions was painted at the very end of Egg's career. He suffered from serious lung disorders which became very debilitating after 1860 and in 1862 he travelled to the Mediterranean coast of France and Italy in an attempt to recover his health. What he saw on that journey clearly provided inspiration for this painting which he worked on during a brief return to his home in London in the latter part of 1862. In early 1863 he went south for his health again, travelling to Algiers, where he died on 26th March 1863. We do not know Egg's intentions in painting The Travelling Companions. Perhaps he was simply recreating a scene which he had witnessed, two ladies with their overflowing crinolines in a confined space, which he found visually stimulating or even just amusing. Perhaps he just wanted to create an enjoyable visual confection of fabric, landscape, symmetry and female beauty. Unlike much of Augustus Egg's artistic output, The Travelling Companions seems to offer no critique, no moral, nor to suggest any narrative. As I've mentioned, Egg was an actor as well as an artist, and he liked to work to a script so that a painting by him will often make the viewer ask, what is the story? But in the case of this enigmatic picture, the question is more likely to be, is there a story? The Travelling Companions is not a particularly big painting, three quarters of a metre wide and a little over half a metre high unframed, but it has a great deal of presence, 
which is in large part due to its strong composition. The initial impression it gives is one of striking symmetry, with the women's dresses becoming almost abstract forms, balanced elements of pattern dominating the flattened composition. The left of the painting appears to mirror the right across the centre line of the canvas. If the left half of the canvas is reversed and overlaid on the right half, the degree to which the two are mirror images is clear. If one of the two companions were to look up and look at the other, it would be as if she were looking into a mirror, or almost. She would see herself, but as someone else. The composition is highly structured, with divisions into thirds being particularly important. The lower edge of the ears of both women rest on a line marking the uppermost third, while because of the different angle of the heads that line also passes through the eye of the lady on the right and the mouth of the lady on the left. The elbows of the two figures rest on the line marking the lower third. The alignment of the windows marks the vertical division into thirds. I've already spoken about the vertical centre line, but the horizontal one is also a key element of the compositional grid, as the bottom of the window opening in the central door rests upon it. The arrangement of the women's heads and bodies suggests a compositional circle, drawing them together and increasing the sense of introspection and enclosure that fills the painting. The figures of the two young women, enveloped in their extensive outfits, dominate the canvas, taking up between them slightly more than half, 55%, of the picture's entire surface area. The woman on the right is awake, and, with head inclined forwards, mouth closed and eye downcast, is reading a book. Her companion on the left appears to be sound asleep. Her head is tilted back, and we can see one firmly closed eye, while her mouth is slightly open. The sleeping lady has a basket of fruit next to her, while the reading lady has some roses on the seat beside her. The title of the painting tells us that they are travelling, and they are indeed seated opposite one another as passengers in a carriage of some kind. Outside the window is a sunshine-filled view of a coastal scene, with a deep blue sea and a picturesque town on a bay backed by hills of green, brown and gold. It seems to be mid-morning on a warm late spring or early summer day. The two travellers are, at the moment, paying no attention to this wonderful panorama. These two women are, of course, the travelling companions of the title, although we could perhaps understand the book, the fruit and the flowers as travelling companions too. And, of course, there is another unseen companion observing these two ladies while unobserved. We, as the viewers of the painting, are in the position of that unseen companion, perhaps looking in through the windows on the other side of the carriage, or in the carriage with the two women, undermining by implication the self-containment of the scene and the privacy of the travellers. The shadows on the seats on the lower right and left might imply the presence of other passengers, other travelling companions in the vehicle, perhaps particularly the one on the left, which seems almost to suggest the shape of a head. We cannot know one way or the other. Just one more unanswerable question posed by this endlessly intriguing picture. The two women in the carriage are being observed, by the artist, by the viewers of the picture, possibly by another person travelling with them, but they show no awareness of it. That gives the picture a potentially voyeuristic appeal, and presents us with an instance of the male gaze at work. This creates a feeling of uneasiness at the breaking of intimacy and privacy the picture represents, a feeling intensified by the air of vulnerability around the woman who is asleep. And is the picture judgmental, too? 
is the artist inviting us to criticize these two young women for wasting time dozing, dreaming, or reading novels, for disregarding the lovely landscape outside the window, for being self-indulgent and vain in their dress and behavior. Perhaps that is the moralizing story we would expect to find in a painting by Augustus Egg, and which, at first glance, seems to be absent from this one. In 1872, John Ruskin recounted an experience he had had on a train between Venice and Verona. Ruskin did not like railway journeys anyway, and he particularly disliked this one, he says, because of two of his fellow travellers. In the carriage with me were two American girls, with their father and mother, people of the class which has lately made so much money suddenly and does not know what to do with it and these two girls of about fifteen and eighteen had evidently been indulged in everything since they had had the means which Western civilization could imagine, and they were travelling through a district which, if any in the world, should touch the hearts and delight the eyes of young girls, between Venice and Verona. But the two American girls were neither princesses nor seers nor dreamers, by infinite self-indulgence they had reduced themselves simply to two pieces of white putty that could feel pain. The flies and the dust stuck to them as to clay, and they perceived, between Venice and Verona, nothing but the flies and the dust. They pulled down the blinds the moment they entered the carriage, and then sprawled and writhed and tossed among the cushions of it, in vain contest during the whole fifty miles with every miserable sensation of bodily affliction that could make time intolerable. Only one sentence was exchanged in the fifty miles on the subject of things outside the carriage, the Alps being once visible from a station where they had drawn up the blinds. Don't those snow-caps make you cool? No, I wish they did. And so they went their way, with sealed eyes and tormented limbs, their numbered miles of pain. This is an extract from a longer account, in which Ruskin reflects, sadly, on the many ways these travellers fell short of his standards. They showed no interest in the lovely North Italian landscape, with all its history and beauty through which they were travelling, but isolated themselves from it, they read French novels, which looked tattered and dubious. They consumed sugared lemons in a manner which Ruskin found disgusting. As they stretched or wriggled, he carefully notes, their thin white frocks were coming vaguely open at the backs. Details like this make it clear that, however much Ruskin may have disapproved of these two girls, he nevertheless had a good long look at them. This is a very hostile, loaded interpretation of a pretty straightforward situation. Teenagers on a hot and uncomfortable train journey, reading, eating, talking, and trying to keep cool, hardly represent the fall of Western civilization. Ruskin's intentions in presenting his young female travelling companions in this way are fairly clear, but we do not have similar clarity over Egg's intentions in the way he presents his. Maybe he too is being judgmental or moralistic, or perhaps he wants his work to be merely anecdotal, a genre piece, or just humorous. We could certainly find some humour in the traveller's seeming indifference to the beautiful scenery outside the carriage, but does that apparent indifference amount to some kind of moral or intellectual failure? Perhaps they have been looking at beautiful scenery for hours, and just want to take a break during the interval of travel. In any case, these two young travellers have not isolated themselves from the outside world. The blinds and curtains are open, and the window is fully open as well. This is shown by the position of the strap which controls the lowering of the window pane in the door. The strap is attached to the bottom edge of the sliding pane so that pulling the strap raises the window, and releasing the strap lowers it. The more closed the window, the more strap is left hanging down inside the carriage. When the window is open, as is the case here, 
with the sliding pane almost entirely recessed within the door, only a short length of the strap is left showing. As a result, the breeze is coming in. It makes the tassel of the blind sway from side to side. One of the travellers is reading a book with stiff brown covers, small in size and ideal for travelling, but there is no clue to the content or type of the book, and we can only make suppositions, shaped by our own preconceptions. It does not have the lurid yellow covers associated with sensational fiction, but it could be a novel, perhaps even a French novel. Then again, perhaps it is poetry, a book of theological reflections, or a study of political economy. Her companion is asleep, but maybe she is just tired. You would be tired as well, walking round all day in crinolines under the hot southern European sun. Perhaps also she is unwell, and has come to this part of Europe not just for pleasure, but for health reasons. We will be talking about that aspect of the picture later. The two women are usually identified as sisters, perhaps twins, and in a further layer of the picture's structures of symmetry they resemble each other very strongly. The same model was used for both, a woman Egg had employed in earlier works. She can be recognised in his 1857 painting of a scene from Thackeray's novel Henry Esmond. Their matching outfits represent the very latest fashions of 1862, crinoline dresses in lush, pearly, silver-grey silk. The early 1860s saw generous use of silk by British dressmakers, particularly since the duties on French silk imported into Britain had been removed in 1860. In this case, the copious folds of silk indicate that these women come from a social background of wealth, privilege and taste. The crinoline was then at the height of its popularity, hence the voluminous skirts that fill the lower part of the canvas. These are cage crinolines. The skirts are supported on a flexible hooped framework, usually of steel wires and bands held together by fabric. This was a far lighter and more convenient arrangement than the layers of heavy petticoats which had formerly been used to maintain the shape and diameter of the skirt. I mentioned just now that crinolines could be tiring to wear on a hot day, but the cage crinoline was a great improvement in that respect on its heavy and cumbersome predecessors, being relatively light and airy and allowing more free movement, and as a result it became extremely popular. But the cage crinoline remained an awkward thing for a woman to have to wear. It made every staircase, uneven surface or narrow space a source of hazard, while to let your skirts get too close to working machinery or an open fire was to invite injury or death. It took up a lot of room and impinged on those around the wearer, making it the target of ridicule and hostility, particularly from men. The practical problems presented by crinolines were very noticeable in the confined and congested spaces of public transport. If you are wearing a crinoline and you sit down, your supports flex, but their circumference stays the same, so your skirts are displaced to the side, possibly incommoding your neighbours. The folds of the dresses worn by the ladies in Egg's picture seem to be overflowing everywhere. They are sitting with their feet on the floor, they do not have their legs raised. The silk that laps against the far side of the carriage is being lifted not by a raised leg or by any movement or posture of theirs, but simply by the structure of their skirts. Egg's treatment of this may seem like exaggeration for satirical or comic effect, but it really isn't. The upper part of the dress, the bodice, cannot be seen on either woman except for a few inches of grey silk cuff just visible at the right wrist of the sleeping lady on the left, because their bodices are covered by large three-quarter length jackets with very full sleeves. The jackets, worn by the women in this 1860s fashion plate, although differing in detail, show the general style and cut of these garments. The ones in the painting are embellished with black machine-made lace and buttons covered in black silk. They flare dramatically from the waist and have wide pagoda sleeves, producing more extensive layers of material 
to merge with the silky waves of the skirts and fill the carriage, creating an undulating landscape inside that echoes the natural landscape outside. The white collars and cuffs are not part of the women's dresses. They are part of separate chemisettes and undersleeves, which were easy to wash and change, and were available in many different styles. The lady who is reading is wearing blue gloves, while her companion has removed hers and they cannot be seen. Perhaps she has tucked them into her pocket, as it was usual for women's dresses of this period to have both a small pocket for a watch and a large pocket for everything else. Both women are wearing amber pendants, possibly heart-shaped, on thin black ribbons around their necks, and have very a la mode black hats with bright red feathers. Hats of the same fashionable kind were painted by John Everett Millet in his two pictures, My First Sermon and My Second Sermon, near contemporary with Egg's painting, and also a depiction of wakefulness and sleep, although spread across two canvases rather than combined in one. So how significant are the differences between these two outwardly identical travelling companions? One is awake, the other is asleep. One has her jacket buttoned, the other has its lower part unbuttoned, and may well have lost a button too. One is wearing her gloves, the other has her hands ungloved. One has her hair bound, the other has her hair unbound. One has a neat red feather in her hat, the other's feather looks tired and scruffy. One is wearing smooth silk, the other looks distinctly crumpled here and there. One has flowers by her side, the other has fruit. The view through the left-hand window is mainly of sea, while that from the right is of land. The lady on the right is upright in posture, correct in dress, is awake and occupying her mind in reading, while her companion on the left is relaxed in bodily attitude, has loosened and removed some of the restrictions of her clothing, and is asleep and possibly dreaming. As we have heard, Augustus Egg was strongly influenced by the works of William Hogarth, and perhaps he is indicating here the contrast between industry and idleness, a theme Hogarth had famously explored in a set of engravings in 1747. We may also be intended to see in the wakeful woman the embodiment of vigilance and guardianship, as she remains awake and watchful while her sister sleeps. They are travelling companions not only on this journey, but on the journey of life itself, and during that journey it seems one sister will always be there to look after the other. The flowers can be seen as symbolic of the passing of time and the journey of life itself. From left to right they pass from buds to full blossoms to a brown and dying bloom. The view of the land in the window behind the wakeful traveller suggests that she remains rooted in reality, while her companion, with the sea as her backdrop, slips into the world of dreams. The undone jacket, the crumpled silks, the carelessness of the lost button, the naked hands, all imply a lack of the virtues which the Victorians esteemed. Is the wakeful woman all innocence, and the sleeper all indulgence? Is the sleeper actually the more aware? of the two, with her relaxed posture and knowing abandonment of sartorial propriety? Or is it a matter of nothing more than different temperaments? She may, after all, simply have taken her gloves off in order to eat an orange. Egg leaves us to make up our own minds. Where are these travelling companions? Like all people who are travelling, they are in two places at once. They are within their means of conveyance, and they are in the place they are travelling through. Their geographical location can be identified very precisely. They are about three kilometres east of Menton, a town on the Mediterranean coast of France, very near the border with Italy, 
In fact, the painting is set pretty much on that border. This map from 1878 shows the area in more detail. Here is Menton, and here is the border between France and Italy. This is the railway running along the coast, through Menton and into Italy, although in 1862, when the painting was created, none of the line shown on this map had yet been completed. There would be no railway at Menton until 1869. The border in this area had only been agreed between the French and Italian governments in 1861, just a year before this picture was painted, and indeed Menton itself had only been absorbed into France in 1860, having previously been a territory of the Principality of Monaco. Menton is the French version of the town's Italian name, Mentone. This view of Menton dates from 1864, and here is the view of Menton visible through the central window in the Travelling Companions. This photograph, from about ten years later, is taken from the road east of Menton, very near, or actually on, the Italian border, and thus even closer to the position Augustus Egg must have used for his view of the town. He must have sketched the view of Menton he later used in The Travelling Companions in the early summer of 1862, while travelling through the town towards Italy, which he was visiting for the sake of his health. At this time a change was taking place in the medical advice offered to people suffering from respiratory complaints. Egg was following the recommendations of doctors drawing on the ideas of the 1850s, in which a restful, warm climate was seen as desirable. Italy and North Africa were strongly favoured. From the early 1860s, however, doctors increasingly looked to climates which, while warm and free from climatic extremes, were stimulating rather than restful. This led to the craze for mountain sanatoriums and to a great boost for coastal resorts, which, with their sea breezes, were seen as offering the stimulation diseased respiratory systems required. Menton was just one of a number of resorts on the French and Italian Riviera which benefited from this change from the 1860s onwards. This view of Menton is the coloured frontispiece from Dr. James Henry Bennett's Winter and Spring on the Shores of the Mediterranean, first published in 1861 as a short essay, and subsequently expanded in several editions and translations, which played an important role in popularising Menton as a health resort, particularly among British and German visitors. Bennett, himself a sufferer from respiratory problems, made his winter home in Menton, and established a practice there. He became such an effective proselytizer for Menton and its beneficial climate that the town authorities honoured him with a monument in the town centre, and regarded him as one of the founders of Menton's later prosperity as a successful Côte d'Azur resort. Augustus Egg's painting thus records a significant period in Menton's history, its absorption into France, and the beginning of its popularity as an important health resort, drawing visitors from far afield. Perhaps the two ladies depicted in the picture are examples of such visitors. Perhaps, fatigued with illness and travel, that is why they are now resting, with one of them asleep. Perhaps they are travelling for health reasons, just as the painter was himself. Perhaps, like him, they have stayed in Menton for a while, and are now travelling on to other destinations. But by what means of transport are they travelling? This painting is often discussed in the context of railway history, as a representation of railway travel in the 1860s, particularly the conditions of travel associated with the railway compartment. These quotes come from railway historians, art historians and cultural historians, who all assume that the picture shows the interior of a railway carriage. The assumption is that these two travellers are in a compartment in a railway carriage such as this one, of a pattern that dated back to the early days of railways, 
in which passenger coaches were modelled on road vehicles. This is a French first-class railway carriage, built for the Chemin de Fer de l'Est in 1876, and on first glance, interior arrangements resemble those shown in Egg's painting, down to the same road carriage-inspired shape of the side windows. Carriages of this type were certainly in use on the lines of the paris lyon Méditerranée railway, which served the south of France. But are these travellers on a train at all? There is nothing about the interior of the vehicle, as shown in the painting, that clearly identifies it as a railway carriage, and several things that suggest that it is not. The limited headroom, the lack of ventilators, luggage racks or lighting arrangements, the absence of steam, smoke or telegraph wires outside the window. It is also worth mentioning that despite all the references to first-class travel, sumptuous furnishings and luxury, the vehicle interior is fairly plain, with little in the way of padding, cushions and fancy fittings. This poster from 1876 dramatically illustrates that staple 19th century horror, murder in a railway compartment, but also shows the details of a contemporary first-class French railway carriage interior rather well. Under all the blood are rich fabrics and comfortably cushioned seats, with quilted padding not only on the seats but on the doors as well. There are deep padded armrests, decorative moulded panels above the windows and substantial luggage racks. Not only is the interior of Egg's vehicle happily a lot more peaceful with less blood splashed around, it is also devoid of these fittings, presenting a much more basic appearance. Again, this lively scene in a railway carriage from about 1870 shows a great deal of padding, ornamental panelling and a luggage rack, which was an indispensable feature of railway carriages and which is entirely absent from the interior represented by Egg. A train de plaisir is of course an excursion train, but it is possible that there is a double meaning here. If this is not a railway carriage, what is it? The answer is clearly a horse-drawn road vehicle of some kind, and it must be a fairly substantial one, with a closed body large enough to have a window on either side of the central door. It could be a private or hired carriage, or the larger passenger-carrying vehicles called diligences, which ran to timetables over prescribed routes. Then there is the location of the picture, as discussed earlier, we know precisely where this picture is set, a little way east of Menton on the French Riviera, just on the French-Italian border. And, as also stated before, there was no railway here in 1862. The station at Menton did not open until December 1869. The paris lyon Méditerranée main line reached Marseille in 1848, but the line from there along the coast to the Italian border took more than 20 years to be completed. When Egg was painting travelling companions, the railway had not yet reached Cannes, and the only options for travel were the road along the coast and what one later guidebook called Our Old Familiar Friends, the Lumbering Diligence and Costly Vetterino, the latter being a reference to a hired carriage. Of course, the fact that the railway had not yet reached Menton would not have stopped Egg setting an imaginary railway scene there. Yet the fact remains that there was no railway at Menton. There was a road, and it was a road Egg knew well. And nothing in this painting is inconsistent with it being set in a vehicle on that road. If our travelling companions are making their journey by the slower and more leisurely means of a road vehicle, they will of course have more time to sleep and to read, and to take in the scenery at their own pace. Perhaps because we think of the Victorian age as the railway age, we expect a Victorian travelling scene to show the railway. Perhaps we are influenced by subsequent imagery showing railway compartment scenes, some directly influenced by Egg's picture. The fact remains that, despite the long-standing tradition of referring to this as a railway carriage scene, these travelling companions may very well not be on a train at all. It is impossible to know for sure one way or the other. Looking at art is like being a tourist or a traveller looking at scenery. 
what we see is always influenced by what we expect to see. This painting remains an enigma. These two travelling companions remain mysterious. All we have are suppositions about their journey, their destination, their characters and histories, their relation to each other. We don't even know whether Egg placed them on a real road or an imagined train. Whether by road or rail, the companions travel on, forever in each other's company, yet each forever self-contained, held like creatures caught in amber in the still frozen moment of a journey that has no end, ever in motion, ever motionless.